All right, here we go again. Uh, if you just happen to watch chapter 13 and are immediately moving into chapter 14, uh, I'll, wel I'll welcome you back to uh, Business 101 online with Joe Lane. Uh, we are in the, uh, the marketing section, chapters uh, 13, 14, 15, and 16. We just uh, covered chapter 13, and of course this was the heart of chapter 13. An exchange of goods and services for money, the marketer is using product, price, place, and promotion. This may stay up here during chapter 14, it may not. You know me, I need a good bit of space, so I may have to get rid of that to, uh, to, uh, to put the things up that we need to do for chapter 14. Uh, I had to take a little bit of a break between 13 and 14. You see I'm in the same outfit, but you know they had to do remake, redo makeup, all this sort of thing, get the hair and everything just, just right. You know, since we're figuring this is going to go viral, international, and, and that type of thing. So I had to get just right, just right for you as I do chapter 14. Okay, 14 really concentrates on products and pricing. So chapter 14, we're going to talk all about stuff about products and stuff about pricing. Okay, the first thing, if you have your, if you have your handout, he says, what do we, when we buy something, do we want value? And of course, the answer to that question is, yes, we want value. So marketers know that we want value. So when they are trying to bring about an exchange, they know that we need to feel like we got value with their product. Value, we can look at it a couple of ways. Uh, good quality at a fair price. Or another way that if you look at our handout, benefits minus cost equal value. If the benefits of something outweigh the cost, you feel like you've got value. If the other way around, uh, you don't. So just keep in mind value. Now there's another term, another thing we want to talk about in chapter 14, as we start talking about products. The total product offer. Now, a lot of these terms that we're going to be throwing out here in chapter 14 are terms that you're, well, you're sort of familiar with, but not real familiar with. A lot of these terms, do they make a tremendous amount of difference to you? The answer is, not really. But they make a tremendous amount of difference to these folks that have these four things right here. The total product offer is just this. It's all the stuff that we think about when we buy a particular product. Everything a consumer evaluates when deciding whether to buy something. And something, I, 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 let, me, let me grab this. A telephone. The total product offer. You know what, a tele what, what, what the cell phone was originally used for? It was like to call people. Hi, I like to talk. But we know that the cell phone's gone a lot further than that. Now, if we were in class, I would ask you the question, I'm gonna ask it to you now, so just mentally. What do you look for when you're getting ready to buy a cell phone? Do you wanna be able to call and talk to somebody else? Yep. What else do you look for? Is price important? Is warranty important? Uh, is appearance important? Uh, capacity important, apps important, the internet important, camera important. Now, you know, we could just go on and on and on and on and on. Same thing with a vehicle. A vehicle is supposed to get you from point A to point B. But what else do you want on that vehicle? Well, I want this and this and this and this and this. So, marketers know when you're buying a cell phone, there's a number of different things that's gonna be important to you. So should those things be important to them? Yes. So the second thing that I guess we're looking at here is when marketers are looking at their product, they're looking at it from the point of view of the customer, and that is, that would be, what are the 
things that they are looking for with my product? What's all the things they're going to be interested in? Obviously, value and total product offer are a couple of things that you need to be familiar with. Now, let me hit you with some more stuff. The product itself, the product item, right? this is jagged, jagged. This is a got a handle on it. This is a chainsaw. Remember, I use abstract art. All right. So this is chainsaw model 407. Okay. A product item would be chainsaw model 407. Now the next thing down here is product line. Do you think that they only sell model 407? Probably not. They may sell problem, uh, uh, model 507, 607, 707, and so forth. Those different models of that chainsaw make up the product line. But in addition to chainsaws, this company may also sell weed eaters. Okay. So that would be a part of the product mix. If you look at your handout, the combination of product lines. So you have a product item. If you have a number of different items, a number of different models, that's a product line. In addition to chainsaws, if you have weed eaters and blowers and whatever else, that would make up their product mix. Is a product item important to, to a, a marketer? Yes. Their product line? Yes. How they put together their product mix. The line that they offer needs to try to meet the needs of their various customers and the different and the different mix is like Procter and Gamble. If they're gonna make if they're gonna produce toothpaste, uh, toothpaste, how about toothbrushes? Kind of work together. Okay. Uh, product differentiation. I think we talked about this in one of the earlier chapters, and I use blue jeans as an example. One of the things that marketers want to do, they want to differentiate their product. If they can make their product different from other people's product, they have a good chance of making you feel like that product is of more value. You put more value in that product because that product is different, that product is special. That's product differentiation. Every product is one of four kinds. Now, I'm going to go back to what I said just a minute ago. Do you ever go out to shop and say, you know, I'm going to go out and look for a product within a product line, and I may even check out the product mix. You probably don't use terminology like that a lot. But to marketers who have the four P's, and the product is, if there's a most important P, I guess it has to be the product, because if you hadn't got that, none of the rest of it counts. So for them, these items are very, very, very important. Now, and also things that you probably want to be familiar with. Okay, now, the classification, again, just looking at your handout, the classification of consumer goods. I'll put them here very briefly. Convenience goods, shopping goods. I can see some erasing going on here in a minute. Specialty goods and unsalt goods. Every good, every good that marketers sell is one of four types. It's either a convenient, shopping, specialty, or unsalt. Okay, think with me. <clears throat> a convenience good is a good that is bought frequently with a minimum of effort usually relatively low cost as it relates to other goods and services. What are some things that you buy frequently at a low cost? Soft drink, milk, chips, candy. Those would be convenience goods. As a matter of fact, they invented a place to sell convenience goods. What's the name of that place? 
Hmm, convenience store. You ever wonder why they call it a convenience store? Well, the reason they call it is not because it's convenient to you, really. The name came from the fact that they sell convenience goods. All right, there's another, another type of good, shopping goods. Shopping goods are goods that you're going to spend a little more time with. They're going to be a little more, <coughs> excuse me, a little more costly. Uh, you're going to want to do some, some comparison shopping and, and some things like that. You are, you're particularly concerned about value. So what would be shopping goods? Um, shoes, clothes, um, electronics, TVs, that sort of thing. Not the real expensive ones, but things like that. Things that you go out and shop for. Those are shopping goods. You go out, you may go out and pick up a, a, a package of Doritos at a convenience store, but you may go to the grocery store and shop for your groceries. Those would be shopping goods. As a matter of fact, they invented a place to sell shopping goods. The shopping mall. Malls are almost totally filled with shopping goods. So that's the second. Now, see, so well, let's, just, let's go ahead and we'll identify them. Specialty goods are, you, are goods that have a unique characteristics, they have a special identity. These goods are your more expensive goods. These are goods where you want a particular good and not a, a substitute for that good. Specialty goods. What would be some specialty goods? Uh, your car would be a specialty good. Your house. Now if you went and bought a uh, a 32-inch TV at Walmart that was $175. That's a shopping good. If you go out and buy one of those QHDEZB slash 407, whatever they call those things, 85-inch TVs that are $2,000, <laughs> that's a specialty good. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. My Timex watch here, that's a shopping good. If this were a Rolex watch, that would be a specialty good. Can I see the difference? Can I see the difference? Okay. And then unsalt goods. Unsalt goods are my favorite goods because as far as talking about them. Unsalt goods are goods that you don't know you need them until you need them. Like what? The example I've used in class is you go to bed one night, you, this alarm clock wakes you up, uh, you swing your feet out of bed, <coughs> you step down, and your floor is red, uh, wet. The, the hot water tank has burst. You, uh, you can't find the keys to your car. You walk out to your car, your car is locked, you can't find the keys to the car, you finally find them there in the car. You've locked your car with the keys in them. Uh, that would be unsolved goods. You don't know you need them until you need them. If, you, if your hot water can't burst, who are you going to call? I had one student told, told me, I'm going to call my dad. Okay, outside of calling your dad, or maybe your dad will make this call, somebody's going to call a plumber. So people that sell services like plumbing services, they sell primarily, not always, because they may be doing something with a new home. But a lot of times for consumers like us, it's unsolved goods. We don't want a plumber until we want a plumber. And when we want a plumber, we really want them right then. Uh, same thing with, with Papa Lock. I've never locked my keys in my car. If, if you could see my family, you'd hear all of them laughing right now. Uh, I do that more than I'd like to admit. And you know, so you have to call and have some. Now, there's some other unsolved goods too. Uh, how often have you ever said, look, I'm going to go out, pick me up some, uh, uh, some uh, Doritos, and maybe go by, check out a pair of shoes, and I'm going to run over and buy me some life insurance. Probably not. Insurance is a lot of times an unsought good. You really don't think about needing it until you need it. Uh, so insurance would be an unsought good. Now one that, that you know, I, I don't want to I don't want to make fun of this and so I won't put it that way. But but funeral services, funeral planning, things like this. A lot of times funeral home will say, you may you may want to plan ahead for those type of things. You don't need it until you need it. So those are 
unsought goods, and you probably thought of a whole lot more than I have. All right. Do you really, 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 really care if something you're going to buy is one of these type goods? The answer is probably not. Do these people care? Does it make a difference to them what they're selling? Huge. All right. So let's go. Are the products quite different depending on the classification of goods? Answer is yes. Is the pricing quite different depending on the classification of goods? Yes. Where you're going to place those goods, is it quite different depending on, on what type of good it is? Or what classification? The answer is yes. How you promote it, is that going to have a lot to do with what classification of good it is? Again, the answer is yes. If your product is a convenience good, M&Ms, what's the pricing on M&Ms? They're low priced as compared to other goods. Where do you place them? Everywhere. You never want to be a, you know, I never want to be away 100 yards further away to buy a package of M&Ms. I want them to be everywhere. How do you promote M&Ms? Well, you know the different ways. They've got to promote to a pretty good segment of the population, but you promote to some different, some people different than you do the others. Uh, M&Ms has, by the way, some great marketing promotions. All right? If you're selling, if you're selling unsought goods, one of the main things you have to do with unsought goods, you've got to let people know they need them. I'll tell you something that could be almost an unsought good, fire extinguishers. Most of the time we don't think about needing a fire extinguisher until we need a fire extinguisher. So if I'm manufacturing fire extinguishers, if that's my product, I'm going to make sure I promote that product in such a way to let you know you need a fire extinguisher. If you don't have two fire extinguishers in your home, you're risking some serious damage. See the idea? So the type of good it is, but convenient shopping, specialty and unsolved, has a lot to do with how those carpenters, with that toolbox, how those marketers are going to use the four Ps. I hope that kind of makes sense to us. Now he talks a little bit about packaging. I didn't put much in your handout, but let's just think about packaging for a minute. I want you to think of two products. I want you to think of a TV set, eh, uh, 55 inch, pretty nice TV, but it's in the box. It's in the box. Then I want you to think of a package of Doritos, and of course they're in, they're in the package. What does packaging do for a product? Well, somebody's going to say, well, it protects the product. It keeps the product from getting damaged. Absolutely right. That's probably the first and number one thing that was, people were thinking of when they put a product in a package, in a box, or in a, in a you know, a Dorito bag. But what else does packaging do? Well, a lot of times the package tells you the price. Actually, the package promotes the product. The way you package something can really promote it. If you ever go by and look at a package of chocolate chip cookies, don't they look good on the front? I mean, the package itself, those cookies look so good, they're probably plunging into some, some milk or something. The, the, the package is very colorful. You know? So they promote the product. Do they give you maybe a lot of times the price of the product? Uh, with the Doritos, uh, the, the, uh, the nutritional breakdown of the product, with that TV set, uh, the, maybe the warranty of that, uh, of that item, of that TV. Uh, how about the features of the TV? Uh, maybe what brand it is. So what I'm, I want to say, and I'm just going to kind of leave this alone because you can kind of think through this yourself, but packaging is really important to marketers. They want to package their product in such a way, in some ways it will help you differentiate their product, but they want their packaging to stand out so you can learn a lot of really good things about the value of their product. Okay, let's go into, and I think it's time, I think it's time to get me some space. So let's go into brands and branding, different brands of products. A brand is a name, symbol, or design that good, identifies goods and services from its competition. A product is a particular brand. 
that makes it stand out from its competition. Now, products can have a brand, a brand name, a brand symbol, a brand logo. That brand can be trademarked. Um, Patented. Just kind of looking at my looking at my hand out here. So, are brands important? Well, yeah. <clears throat> Let's see. What's this? The color is not right. McDonald's. We know that simply by the symbol. Uh, what's the slogan for McDonald's? What's it been? I'm loving it. They change the slogan occasionally. How about this? All right. Remember abstract art. The Nike swoosh. Okay. What's their What's your saying? Just do it? Okay. Isn't it? All right, how about this? If you said the peace sign, it's not what I was looking for. Mercedes. Now, I'd love to draw, uh, draw the Jaguar for you, but it takes me a long time to do a Jaguar. But you understand that, that some, the, the name itself, I always misspell this. I think that's right. Steel products, I just drew the, the weed eater and the chainsaw. Steel, that's a brand of chainsaws. Now if any of you that are, that are watching this video, you know, with the, the, any of the millions of you that are watching this video, if you are familiar with steel products, and I ask you, if I say steel products, what comes to your mind? You would tell me things like, kind of expensive, dependable, rugged, perform well, easily serviced. There's a number of things, steel products, there's value in the steel brand. All right, so here's, I want to throw this up for you. What do brands bring to a product? It brings equity, or another word for that is value. There's equity or value in the brand. Loyalty. Some of you are very loyal to certain brands, and you wouldn't take anything else. Do you think marketers, oh, I, I raised them, but those marketers that were right here, do you think they want for us as consumers to make us loyal to their product? Sure, sure. And it also brings awareness. Equity, loyalty. If you have happened to have followed me on both chapters 13 and 14, do you notice how much harder I'm trying to spell correctly? Uh, since this goes out, to where it's, where it's forever and ever there, I've tried to do a little bit better job of, of spelling so that my bosses don't you know, catch me or anything. So these are some things that you can say. There's value in the brand, there's loyalty in the brand, there's awareness in the brand. So as that being the case, are companies pretty protective of their brand? Their answer is yes. If you ever see Coca-Cola, Is that right? Anyway, well, I messed up my spelling. If you ever do that, right at the very end, you'll see a little R. That little R stands for registered. That's a registered trademark of Coca-Cola Corporation. You can't use that. John Deere. I can't draw you a John Deere up here, but what color is our John Deere product? Well, they're, they're green and yellow. What color green? John Deere green. It's a registered color, John Deere green. 
You get the idea? They are very protective of their, their brand. They're very, they trademark them, they patent them. Patents more and more for things that you invent. And if you invent something, you have, you have exclusive use of that product for maybe 20 years. But trademarks and patents are things that are used to protect brands because brands have value because they bring this to the product. Pretty important stuff. Now I say all that, and let me say this. So what is this? A generic brand. What is that? Well, a generic brand is kind of like a, a no-brand product. Okay, you've been telling me how important, important, important brands are, how they bring value, equity, awareness, and everything to the product. Yeah, I have. But you mean sometimes people sell, basically sell non-branded or no-brand products? Yeah, in some situations. What's the biggest appeal to generic products? Cost. They're usually much cheaper. And so as a result of that, some products can be sold generically, especially in drugs. They can be sold, they can be sold as generic products. Uh, I don't know exactly, I, I don't know if I told you or not, but I better tell you, these classifications of products here, you probably want to know those. You'd probably want to know the four classifications of, of goods and maybe write me a little bit of a sentence about each one and give me an example. I think that would probably be something that you would, you would want to do. Packaging. I think you might want to be able to, if I came up with a multiple choice question, which of the following does package allow uh, marketers to do or companies to do? A, promote the product. B, protect the product. You might want to be aware of the things that packaging does for a product. And then with brands, I'd certainly be familiar with what a brand is, a brand name, a brand logo. I'd be familiar with what trademarks and patents are. They're all pretty well laid out on your handout. One other thing he talks about in this chapter. Now, one of the things that y'all know I do is I repeat myself. Most of the time, do I know I'm repeating myself? Yeah, most of the time I do. And so I'll repeat myself here. We're talking about, you know, the four P's. We're talking about product stuff. Product value, total product offer, product item, product line, product mix, product differentiation. All those be familiar with. Uh, marketing uh, uh, classifications of goods, uh, packaging of goods, uh, product branding. Right. Again, I wanted to say this. Do, is that of tremendous importance to you? Well, some of it's important to you, but it's tremendously important to marketers that they understand all of these things and how these are things affect the consumer. Okay. Every, every, every product has what's called a product life cycle. The product life cycle. Now, it has to do with sales and profits of a, of a product. There's four stages as far as a product life cycle. And it goes like this. And here's how it works. Every product has a product life cycle. First of all, the product is introduced. Then, hopefully for a while, the product is in growth. That means it's selling more and more and more and more. And I really didn't grow this very well. It'd be a whole lot better if I had done it like this, because this is more typical of a lot of products. Okay, let's do it that way. Then, you have the maturity phase. Where it's in maturity. And then you have the decline. I always like to give examples. Examples seem to help. Some products have a very long product life cycle. Some products have a pretty short product life cycle. Let's take, let's take a, a movie that hits the big screen. 
uh, let's take a movie that that, uh, that that comes out and hits the big screen. Okay, how long does it usually remain on the big screen? Now, right now, I realize we don't go out to see the movies, but typically speaking, when a new movie hits the big screen for you to go see, how long does it normally stay? Well, if it's a pretty good movie, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, if it's a really, really good movie, seven weeks, eight weeks. If it's not a very good movie, two or three weeks. So what I'm saying is this. Let's take movies. They introduce them. A lot of fanfare. They usually do a lot of promotion. The movie hits the big screen and man, it grows like crazy for a couple of weeks. Just takes off. Then for a couple of weeks, it's in maturity. And then after that, it starts declining. And then it goes away on the big screen. Then what happens to it? comes back as a DVD and it goes through that same product life cycle again as a different as a different product as a DVD so the thing that's that's kind of important here now again is this of earth-shaking value to you probably not but to marketers is it important how you go about introducing that product? Have you done marketing research already to make sure this product is something people want? What you don't want to happen is it not go through the product life cycle. You introduce it and it goes, whoom. Nobody wanted it. That's, that's tragic. Uh, that's tragic. A few people should, should lose some jobs if that happens because you haven't done any, any marketing research. But you have a, you know, you put a lot of promotion into it. You have manufactured that product. At this particular point, you spent a lot of money and you ain't made any. There's certainly no profit. Then that, the, the product grows. And more, you hope it stays in growth for a long time. And usually they say pro products are usually make, start making a profit somewhere towards the end of their growth stage. Then they have a maturity stage where they, they stay out there on the market for a good while. And then eventually they will decline and go away. What marketers want to happen is this. Products are never going to stay in the growth stage forever. I mean, there's just so long you can grow before you level off. So introduction, heavy promotion, Promoting still heavy here. You're in maturity state. What you want your product to do is stay in maturity a long time. The longer you can keep your product in maturity, as I go off, as I go off, and I disappear from you because I'm just keeping going in maturity. The longer that product can stay in maturity, because you you are good at promoting it, you're good at producing it. This is really profitable times here. What are some products that's been in maturity a pretty good while? Doritos? Coke? How long has Coca-Cola been in maturity? What do they do to stay in maturity? They change up, they, they add a flavor. Uh, they, they do some things, they put it in a different size container. They do some things to change it, but it's still Coke. And it stays in maturity for a long, 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 long time before it starts declining. You know, my favorite one that I usually bring up in class, and we may have talked about it in some other, Barbie. Barbie. Now, I know if you're watching this, you're laughing. Barbie! Well, look, Mattel makes Barbie. And they, they are laughing all the way to the bank. How old is Barbie? Barbie, 61 years old. Barbie was born in 1959. And Barbie has been... If you wanted to say that Barbie may be in slight line, I probably wouldn't argue with you, but, but I'm not sure. But Barbie has been in maturity a long, long time. You know, how do you keep Barbie in maturity? Over time, you know, they've, uh, they've, changed, uh, they've changed her physical size. Barbie at the beach, Barbie here, Barbie there. They've reinvented things that Barbie does. Barbie's got a boyfriend. And, you know, and this is something I always like to, I always, if you were here, I would ask you, if you know Barbie's boyfriend's name, raise your hand. Be quiet, don't say a word, just raise your hand. I usually have at least half to two-thirds of the class that raises their hand, including me. 
And then somebody I'll say, okay, who it is? Who is it? <laughs> who it is? Who is it? It's Ken. And then I'll say, listen, what does it say to you that you know the name of a doll's boyfriend? I mean, does that seem a little weird to you? That's marketing. That's branding. That's putting awareness and loyalty and equity into their products. Isn't that interesting? You, you know the golden arches. You know the swoosh. You know, um, you know the songs. You know the logos. That's in your head. Marketers do a great job, a job at doing that. Okay, so that's a product life cycle. Got way too strong out on that. That's a, that would be a be familiar with thing as well. Just be familiar with what a product life cycle is and the different, the, the different phases of the product life cycle. The, the last thing in this, and I, of, of the, all the stuff that I could have erased on the board, the one thing I erased that I shouldn't have are the four P's. Product, price, place, promotion. Okay. What we've been talking about in chapter 14 is mostly about the product. And I'll make you, I probably got you sick about products, haven't you? I've said a lot of stuff about product. That's important to marketers. But he talks about one other little thing. If you've got your handout, uh, your study guide, the very last of chapter 14, he talks about pricing. How do marketers go about pricing their product? Now, there's different ways that you can price your product. I just want to hit a couple of them with you here uh, that I have on your handout. Now, <clears throat> let's do two of them and see if you're still with me after, this, after going this far. Cost-based pricing. If you do cost-based pricing, what are you basing your price on? If somebody said cost, that's a good answer. You base your price on the cost to produce that product. If it costs me 50 cents to produce that product, I'm, all right, I'm gonna, it's 50 cents, I'm gonna add five cents, I'm gonna set it for 55 cents, I'm gonna make a five cent product, uh, profit on each one of these items that I sell. That's basing my pricing on cost. All right, now that you're warmed up, what do you think competition-based pricing is? Basing your price on your Competition. Okay, very good. Now, the other three that I want us to look at is skimming pricing. Uh, there's no good place. Uh, see if you can keep up with S P I M M I N G. Skimming pricing is pricing your product high to maximize profit. When the Hummer came out, remember the remember the Hummer, Hummer. Hummer. When the Hummer came, you, know, you probably don't remember the Hummer coming out. It's been a long time ago, but you know the Hummer. When the Hummer first came out, the Hummer was expensive. And did they cut the price on it and do all No. There was no, matter of fact, you know what the slogan was for the Hummer? Like nothing else. That was their slogan. And, and there was nothing else like the Hummer. And so, they priced that product high and maximized their profit because there's nobody to compete against them. That would be skimming pricing. Pricing high, maximizing your profit. Just the opposite of skimming pricing is penetration. Penetration pricing. That's where you price low to pick up market share. I'm, it's not that I'm trying to maximize my profit what I'm trying to do is get a large share of the market. Remember when we talked about the, the different eras of marketing, the customer relationship era, that last one? Well, well what you can do is, with uh, penetration pricing, you're trying to get a large share of the market to buy your price because you're, you're, your product because you've got it priced pretty low. Once they get you hooked to their product, then they're hoping you will be loyal and you will see value in that product. And then the last type of, uh, of pricing I wanted you to, to us to look at is, 
ELP, everyday low pricing. Who invented that? Yeah, I could hear several of you way back there saying Walmart. Everyday low pricing was kind of invented by Walmart. So what we've done in chapter 14, and, and you've got to be you got to be proud of this board. This is really a mess. Right. What we've done in chapter 14 is we've looked at a lot of things to do with the product. By the way, I would be familiar, I'd be familiar with everyday low pricing skimming pricing and penetration pricing. And I think I've mentioned most of the thing. If I didn't say I think I did, I'd be familiar with the, uh, the product life cycle. I think I've covered all the, 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 the knows and be familiar with in, uh, in chapter 14. Okay, so we've looked at the product and how the product is priced in chapter 14. I'll let you, I'll give you a little hint. Chapter 15 is talking about placement of products. Chapter 16 is talking about promotion of products. All right. <clears throat> I think it's time. I'm not sure that Professor Pierce is going to be watching all these videos. So let me do this. I think <clears throat> it's Ryan Pierce at La Delta dot edu I think it's probably time after you've you've done the chapter 14 video to send Ryan Pierce an email telling him what a brilliant job we've been doing on these videos you know that you know almost like like uh, uh, top-line actor uh, work being done here uh, top-notch star power that I'm, I'm delivering uh, to you. So if you want to put, you know, put, you know Ryan Pierce, just, just tell him, great videos, I mean, it's like great movies. Joe Lane is a wonderful star of the movie. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. You can just do that. Not figuring he's going to get overwhelmed with emails. I thought I'd just throw that in. Uh, but I think that's enough silliness. I think we better wrap up chapter 14. Uh, and uh, we will, we've got that done. We will be back pretty soon, and we'll be doing chapter 15. All right. Thank you.